what this is. Occasionally, recently, I've been doing, you know, more informal live coding types of things where I worked on compiler features. That's not what this is. This is a more formal presentation of work that's been happening for the for, for the last five or six weeks. Um, I'm going to try to keep it short, uh, if only because Handmade Hero is coming on at 8 p.m. But who knows how long it's going to go. I'll probably stay and do questions afterwards. Um, last time, I had sort of implied that I was going to work toward doing an object system demo, um, which I think by the time we do that, it'll start being really evident, like what the flavor of this language is or what the, what the spirit of it is and what makes it so different from many other languages. Well, that'll be one thing. I mean, the compile time program execution already <laughs> goes pretty far that way. Um, but I decided instead of like leaping forward and trying to reach for grand new features, I wanted to make sure that the base of the language was stable and robust and had a lot of the stuff that it needs. Um, because, you know, the problem with a lot of programming languages is they end up like toy languages and they don't really do all this stuff that you want, but they do this one thing that the author thought was really cool, right? And I wanted to make sure that this doesn't end up in the domain of toy languages. So, um, I looked at what kind of stuff do I want to do when I'm programming all the time and what, you know, what kinds of things does this language system need uh, in order to be more robust and I worked on that and just like solidifying the core of the language. Um, now part of that is new features which I'm going to demo now but part of it is just you know testing a bunch of different cases making sure that things that I demoed in the last demo really work generally across all sorts of situations that you would counter encounter in the language and of course as soon as you start testing that stuff you realize um, oh it doesn't always so you know like last time I demoed a dynamic array and it was not evident from the demo but if you look closely you'll see that I only ever use it on things that are of pointer size and that's because the code for the dynamic array wasn't generalized to large objects or things like that now it is right so I did a bunch of that kind of thing um, but uh, let me show you what I did feature wise um, the first thing oh yes so if you'll recall the sort of the biggest program in this uh, language so far um, is this uh, so I'm not running it at compile time anymore because I don't want to totally show off like that but you know this is the little uh, Space Invader program or Galaga program where you can fly around right it's, it's got a little more functionality than I demoed before like these guys have slightly different movement patterns and they actually shoot back and stuff like that and I can explode right um, but it's basically the same scale of program as it was before. And last time I demoed uh, using that program some ways that compile time program execution could help build your program, right? Let me go into there. You know, I, I demoed some stuff uh, like running a function that includes files, you know, dynamically instead of um, using a directive and I demoed writing a preprocessor that processes those, but I didn't quite get to the level of really how you would interface with that, um, that with the command line on a day-to-day -day fashion, right? And how you would really build a program uh, on a team of other people. And so I wanted to continue the build option stuff a little bit further and show you exactly how that would work uh, in the real world. So um, here, uh, I have a situation that's much like what we did last time. This run directive down here says that at compile time, when this run directive is hit, we're going to run this function and anything else that needs to get compiled in order to make that function work. Now, um, we'll open this so you can see what we printed over here, right? So we've got a few printfs as soon as we start building. This file path thing is just a directive that tells you what the path is of the current file that's being compiled and I assigned it to a variable just to make it clear that it wasn't some weird printf thing like it might look like if I insert it in here. So we're just printing out the file path of the current file, right? We see that. Um, 
And then we've got this build option stuff, which are variables that I can set to tell the compiler how to behave, right? But I'm doing that from my own program. I'm not doing it from an external program like Make or Visual Studio or anything like that, right? By the time you write a complex video game or web server, or a, I mean anything that's complicated, right? You're specifying a lot of very careful actions that that program has to perform perfectly, right? Compared to what it actually does when it's running, building the program ought to be really simple. So the idea that you need some totally separate system to specify the building of the program is a little bit absurd. It's silly, right? Because you're already able to specify things that are much more complicated. And uh, you're just making the situation a lot more needlessly complicated as soon as you involve a make language or an IDE with special menus that make it really hard to change all the options and all the variants of your build, right? So I'm going to show in a more practical way how you would approach this. So right now, say I'm just messing around as a single person. I'm getting my project up and running. So I'm doing things like this. I'm saying run this build. I've only got one kind of build that I'm doing, and here's what I want. I want it to be a debug build, right? So I'm setting build options, optimization level to debug. Um, emit line directives is a thing that's for me. Um, you know, we're generating C code right now, and line directives will make, if there's an error in the C code, point back to this, right, so that I can debug. Um, but if you're actually working on the compiler, you may just want to jump into that program and see which line of the output is messed up um, in the C file. So this is not really a user level feature, but it's one that I've put in for my own convenience for a while. Um, I can set the executable name, right? And then I call update build options just to tell the compiler, hey, uh, some of these settings have changed, and it'll change its behavior accordingly, right? Then I'm going to set my path. I'm going to say, look for any other files that I add uh, in the same folder as the current file that's being compiled, and then we add all this stuff, right? And so now what happens is uh, you can see here uh, we, we print our debug information. We've added all these files. And you can see here, if you know uh, cl.exe's options in Windows, this is a debug build, right? It's optimization level debug. Um, is there any other th settings? No. But uh, now I'll set this to release, right? And I'll change it, right? So now it's a release build. It's slash 02, which sets the optimization level, and Z7, which includes debug, ex debug information I suppose that should have been in the other build, too. <laughs> anyway, um, the point being, you can toggle those settings uh, from here, right? And that's pretty easy. Now, that's what you might want to do when you're informal, right, and messing around with a project on your own. But then what do you do when you're on a team of people and, uh, you know, you've got eight people using source control? And if you edit your source file like this to... Uh, you know, to change your build settings, you're going to be conflicting with other people's build settings. You like need a canonical thing that's not going to change that everyone can refer to, right? So what you do is you factor your code a little bit. I mean, you could have some totally external file that's also part of this program that's not in source control that you personally use. And, you know, you can do that. But the cleanest way to do it is probably this. So instead of having one function called build, I'm going to factor it. There's going to be a function called build common that you know, it's going to print our debugging info, and then it's going to add all these build files, because um, we want to do that no matter what. But then we're going to have these functions build debug and build release that call build common, and then do whatever else we want to that's in particular, right? So for this, it's just setting the optimization level. This, this was redundant in both of these. But the point is, anything in build debug can be anything that I want. Anything in build release can be anything that I want, right? Now, I still would have to right? If I was doing this the way I was doing before, I'd say run build debug, right? Or run build release. And maybe I comment or uncomment these, but that's still annoying to other people trying to work on the program. So instead, you can specify that from the command line. So right now, if I try to compile this right now, no compile time program execution is going to happen because I took out that build directive or that run directive. So it's not going to be able to compile anything, right? It's like you're trying to call some function uh, invaders, right? Which I guess is in main. Yeah, you're trying to call invaders, and I don't even know what that is because we never even added any files, right? But you specify on the command line dash run build debug, right? This can actually be any expression in the whole programming language. Um, you'd probably put it in quotes if it got really complicated, but uh, there we go. So we've got a debug build, right? Or I can say on the command line dash run build release, 
right? And all this says is call the function build release at compile time and then continue building after that, right? So that's cool. Uh, you know, here we've got our release options, here we've got our debug options. So uh, at that point, um, you've got a pretty nice situation. You can have many people working on the same program. All you need to do is just have this command to compile, bound to something or in your history or whatever, and you don't need an IDE to build, you don't need a make system to build, right? It's all right here. Um, so that's very exciting. All right. Um, I guess I'll take demo, uh, questions on all of these things at the end. It, because this is broken into specific sections, it would probably be better for questions if I took them now, but we've got a schedule to stick on. All right. So uh, as part two, let me put this in C++ mode so we get a little syntax highlighting. Syntax highlighting, again, is going to be a little wrong because Emacs thinks this is C++, but what can you do? All right. Since last time, there have been some syntactic changes to the language, and I want to explain what those are and why they were done. The main motivation really is to uh, clean things up and get rid of some inconsistencies that are in C and C++ syntax, um, mostly uh, to do with the ar way arrays and pointers are declared. Um, so I shifted to a, a syntax where arrays and pointers um, get uh, get introduced on the left of a type definition, much the way that Go does. Whereas for C, like part of the type, you know, if it's a float or whatever, goes on the left, and then the array part goes on the right, and the name goes in the middle. So we're getting rid of all that, right? Um, when you're doing that, when you're, when you're trying to introduce this consistency and either put things on one side or the other, you kind of have to pick which side. Is it on the left or is it on the right? I went for on the left because that gets rid of a couple of uh, annoying... Um, syntactic ambiguities, but I could do it on the right as well. Maybe it could change. Uh, but let me just explain what this syntax is. I don't think syntax is still super important for now simply because it's so malleable, right? We're not deciding on a final thing. But I want to explain to you what it looks like um, so that the rest of these examples make sense. Um, now the first thing is the way pointers are declared, right? C, in C and C++, if you declare a pointer, you use a star, and a star is also what you use to dereference. And the philosophy in C is that you're like writing a declaration of the way that you would use it. And that's really confusing, actually, and um, I don't think it's helpful at all. So uh, what I've switched to is writing the declaration as what it is, and then writing usage as what it is, right? So here I've got some struct called entity, and I've got an E that's an entity, and now I'm going to take, I'm going to declare the type of something called pointer, right? Pointer is of the type pointer to an entity, right? So this ampersand, right, in, in C, um, this would be the equivalent of an ampersand, uh, or at least down here it would be, right? In C, you would say that. Here I'm saying that. Um, I didn't want to use ampersands everywhere because I think that's kind of ugly looking if you're going to put them in all your declarations all the time. So I just did this, which is the way in Pascal that you write a pointer, and it's pointy, and it's symmetric, so it looks nice. Um, but here's the point of this pointer declaration, which is just um, I'm declaring a pointer to a type, and this is a pointer to a value. It's the same thing, right? Like the up arrow means I'm going in this way of abstracting myself away from the type or value, right? And then we still dereference stuff with star down here. So star brings us toward the value and hat brings us away from the value. And it's very consistent, right? So uh, I like that a lot. It only takes, you know, five minutes to get used to and it's cool. Um, so now because we have type inference and stuff here, I don't have to, again, declare the type of this and then assign it. I can just do all that in one step, right? Um, but I, for purposes of showing this parallelism, I wanted to do this in two lines. Okay, arrays. Um, I wanted to put everything on the left, and it seems to make sense to me anyway. Like, if you want to say something is an array of some type, the array part is probably pretty important, right? So you want to see that first. Um, so, you know, this is... Uh, an array, an n long, right? We declared n up here as a constant that's 10, right? Uh, this is an n long array of floats. 
Um, you know, this is a pointer to an entity or an address of an entity, right? And this is an n long array of addresses of entities. Um, and you can write these things very neatly and you can read them off in the order in which they're written. So, like I said, dereferencing is the same as in C right now, but for the purposes of conserving operators and maybe being clearer anyway, um, we might decide to go full Pascal and dereference. I think this is what you do in Pascal to dereference is you put the pointer operator on the other side. Um, I don't know. I haven't felt the need to do that yet, but it's a possibility, right? So then down here, you know, I declared these pointers, so I might as well use them, you know, I'm setting them to new entity or whatever. Okay. Um, we can run that part of the demo, uh, but it's not going to do anything because it didn't print anything out. You'll note down here that we're getting some uninitialized uh, value complaints. Those are actually from the C compiler, and they're not a mistake. They're there for good reason, uh, and we'll get to that in the next section, part three. Um, so I want to talk about default values. C and C++. Um, I was someone saying that hat is in the middle of the keyboard and is harder to press. It might be a little bit, um, although it's actually, it's about as close to the left hand as ampersand is to the right hand. So I think it's just a matter of what you're used to. Like I thought it was harder to press for the first few minutes and now I don't think that, although that is an important consideration. And you know, like I said, that particular syntax doesn't have to stay. It's just what I'm using right now because it looks nice. Uh, anyway. C and C++ uh, don't initialize plain old data values unless you initialize them manually. And this is a performance concern, right? A lot of higher level languages will automatically set your values to zero or something like that. Um, uh, in this language, uh, that's we try to find a new compromise that works better for everybody, right? Um, the the thing about C or C++ is it's very easy to make a mistake and forget to initialize your variable and then go use it. And sometimes the compiler can detect that and tell you that you made a mistake, but sometimes the compiler won't detect that. And then you've got a little bit of a debugging session in for you. And, you know, um, but that's important, right? Like those of us who try to build things that are performant, um, we want that ability to not have things be initialized because if you're going to instantiate a giant array of stuff and fill it, you don't want to have to fill it like twice, you know, first with zero and then with the actual stuff that you want in it and take all those cache misses and stuff. So the question was, what can we do that gives us the best of both worlds? So some of you guys may have seen me implement this the other week. Um, the way it works now is every single thing in the language always gets initialized uh, to its default value, which is usually zero unless you specify a different default value. Um, but for performance reasons, you have the ability to say, well, actually, um, let's not initialize this thing. And you can do that in a couple different ways, depending on what you need to do. And I'll show you how that works now. So I'm going to repeat the same sort of situation four times just to demo things. So first, we're going to show default values, uh, which again, I demoed last time. So I can say f is a float that's equal to 3. When I print f that, it'll tell me it's 3. I can declare a vector 3 with three floating point values. And they each have default values of one, four, and nine, which is a little bit silly. I don't think I would ever make a vector three that way in real life, but um, it's a good test, right? Um, so we're gonna instantiate a vector three. We're gonna print the values. Um, we're gonna make 100 vector threes. We're gonna pull one out of the middle, right? Or approximately the middle, the 50th element. And we're gonna print the value of that. And so did I, did I compile that? this time, yeah. So here's the first thing, and you can see that that worked. So f is 3, the first vector, v1, is 1, 4, and 9, right? So it got the default values, and the second vector here is also 1, 4, and 9. So all of these 100 vector 3s in this array got initialized, which might be what you want if you want that for convenience, but you definitely don't always want that. Um, but we'll get to that. Okay, so the second thing that happens is Suppose we don't want to specify all these default values because maybe a lot of time in our program we want things to be zero anyway. Well, in this implicit default values section, um, 
we're doing the same thing, but we're omitting those non-zero values. So f is a float. So now it's going to be zero when we print it out. x, y, and z are floats. We haven't given them default values. Oh, by the way, this is a different vector three than this one, right? So we have local structs, and that works just fine, uh, unlike some other compilers I could mention. Um, so uh, you know, we're doing exactly the same thing after this. We're instantiating a vector three, it should be zero. We're making a hundred of them, we're pulling the 50th out, it should be zero. And we can look at our run, and in fact, all this stuff was zero. Um, but now we're going to do uh, a third thing. We're going to say, we don't want default values, right? We want this code to run fast, and so we're going to explicitly uninitialize everything. So I have a local float, uh, its value is this dash, dash, dash which means don't initialize this. Now I picked that uh, just because it's easy to type and it's easy to search for, right? When you do this, if you have funny behavior in your program, you want to be able to search for all the things causing kind of funny behavior, whether they're you know, this thing or a weird cast or whatever. So part of my goal is to make all the mildly dangerous things searchable, but to let you do them easily at any time, right? So here's a vector three. I'm saying don't make x, y, and z zero by default. Make them uninitialized because we want to go fast, right? Um, and again, you might think, well, isn't that a little bit of work to specify that? And it's like, well, you have to do the work either way, right? In C and C++, you have to do this constant work of like mentally having this mental load of have I initialized this thing yet or not? Um, here the idea is to shift the balance to something that gives you fewer bugs um, and the ability to say that I want performance at the risk of a little bit of bugs, right? Um, although that risk is greatly decreased because you're saying it's uninitialized, so at the time when you say that, you hopefully then go handle it. Um, so, so here we're doing the same steps. This vector is going to be uninitialized, and this one is going to be uninitialized. Um, this whole array of 100 vector threes is going to be uninitialized, so when we pull one out of the middle, we should get arbitrary values. Now, a lot of the time, um, we're going to get zeros anyway, but I think if I run this program a bunch of times, we might start to get funny values. We're not really getting funny values here. But note that we're getting one down here, right? So this is why, you know, uninitialized values are dangerous because I might think like, oh, they're being correctly set to zero, but they're not. Like at some point, there's going to be some non-zero stuff on the heap and these are going to come out funny. Just like this value down here is like randomly changing every run. Um, on my laptop, a lot more of these values <laughs> came out random, but for whatever reason, on this machine, it's not happening so much. And that's the... That's the danger of uninitialized values, right? You get bugs that are uh, inconsistent. But your program goes a lot faster. So um, now this is when I declare the thing to say that they're uninitialized. So this is basically what C does by default, right? Um, I can explicitly say I want that behavior. Uh, but down here, um, I have a fourth behavior, right? Which is um, I'm going to give default values to my vector. And, and I could to the float, but the float doesn't make as much sense in this case, so I'm skipping it. But here we have our vector. It's got values of 1, 4, and 9. Um, so if I just instantiate it normally, I would get those initialized. But here I'm going to say v1 is a vector 3, but you know what? Don't initialize it. I don't want that, right? Or this array is 100 vector 3s, but you know what? Don't initialize it. Um, I just want memory for 100 vector 3s, and I'm going to fill it in, right? So this time, you know, v1 is uninitialized, v2 is uninitialized. Here we're declaring it normally without the triple dash. So that's going to get these values of 1, 4, and 9. We can also use this with new. So we're going to make a new vector 3, um, and uh, it's not going to be properly initialized. You won't see 1, 4, and 9. So note that we're seeing zeros a lot of the time in here instead of 1, 4, and 9, except this number is kind of random. Um, but down here, v3 uh, is um, getting 1, 4, and 9 as it should. I wonder, am I making, I'm making a debug build. Maybe that has to do with why a lot of these are zero. I don't know. doesn't matter. Um, OK, so that is explicit uninitialization and is hopefully a safer way to make your program fast. Now, there is a downside to having default values all the time, which is that if you forget to initialize something, you know, in C, at least in some cases, the compiler will warn you that you didn't initialize that thing. 
Whereas if everything's initialized, then that's not an error anymore. So it remains to be seen whether this is entirely good, right? I don't want to come and try to sell you this language feature and say, oh my god, it's amazing. But it should be at least be pretty easy to tell that your program's wrong when things are explicitly initialized to zero, because if you didn't want them to be zero, uh, then the behavior should be obviously wrong. And if you did want them to be zero, which you do want for most things most of the time, the behavior should be fine, and it should be a great notational convenience not to have to remember to initialize, and, and reduction in cognitive load not to have to initialize things all the time. All right, so part four. Whoops. Uh, part four, I'm going to talk about the array types that are built into the language. Um, I demoed uh, dynamic arrays in the last demo, but I'm going to talk about how you use these practically uh, now. And then I'm going to lead into uh, part five with this, which is iterators, uh, which have been greatly expanded since last time. Um, to motivate why I would put a lot of work into building arrays uh, as a low-level type in the language, like implemented by the compiler, well, first of all, um, I think, you know, I don't think you should build every data type into the compiler. Like, uh, most data types should be defined by your program to be what they want, but some things are very common, and so you want them to be very fast, and you want them to compile very quickly, because you're going to have them all over your program, and uh, you want the debug to visualize them. Uh, primitive types uh, as clearly as possible, right? And so when your array is built into a language, uh, it, it lets all those things happen if you don't screw it up, right? So uh, as before, uh, you know, we have a basic static array here, which in C, this would be the same as saying int static array of n. I'm just saying n int, right? Dynamic array, like last time, I believe in the previous demo, dynamic arrays were empty brackets, right? But this time that's not true. Um, they're, uh, they've got double dots in the brackets. And then up here, I've got empty brackets. But what empty brackets here means is this is an array, and I don't know or care what type it is, but I just have a pointer to the data, right? In this case, that's a pointer to a bunch of ints, and a length value, right? So this is, uh, this is a pointer and a length. It's the same as in C if you pass two parameters, a pointer and a length, right? But now the compiler knows that those two values are associated, and the debugger knows that those two values are associated. And this is so common that I think it's a good boon to both program correctness um, and your ability to just see what your program is doing, to have them put together in one thing. Um, Walter Bright of DFAME uh, wrote an essay called C's Biggest Mistake. It's on the Dr. Dobbs blog here. And he talks about how a lot of the type unsafety or the memory unsafety of the C runtime and inherited by C++ um, comes from this original idea that arrays get turned into pointers as soon as you pass them as a parameter to a procedure and they lose their length information. If you build your whole library with expecting length information in the form of this, then it's a lot, it's a lot easier to have fewer bugs, right? So Walter, whoops, not water bright. <laughs> Walter calls this C's biggest mistake and I tend to agree. Um, I, there might be some other ones that are almost as big, but I think that's the biggest one. Um, Anyway, so that's why I'm putting this effort into building these things into the compiler. I don't want to build everything into the compiler. So for example, like a dictionary or a hash map, I'm not so sure that needs to be in the compiler. I think maybe the, the approach of providing that uh, in the standard library might be better for that kind of thing. But you know, when I write gameplay code, for example, all I freaking do is iterate over arrays all the time. I'll, I'll get into that in a bit. Um, so I feel like arrays should be in the language with very solid support. So here I'm doing, uh, this is an iteration over integers. I demoed that last time. Um, and I'm just dropping every integer from 0 to n minus 1 into this static array. And I'm also adding those to the dynamic array. Because we don't have parameterized types yet, um, there's no concept of a function that is variadic or, or is uh, polymorphic based on the type of its arguments, so I have to treat these as void pointers for now, but eventually dynamic arrays will have nicer syntax when you add things. Um, 
But the point is, these two types of things, they're different array types. The way they store things in memory is different, right? Um, this one doesn't have a count that's stored anywhere, right? The number of elements in this array is known only by the compiler at compile time. It's not anywhere in memory, right? Um, this one has that length stored in memory, as well as a maximum length, as well as like a pointer to the elements that are stored disjointly on the heap or whatever, whereas this one is only the elements, right? So these two are kind of different in the way that they're, uh, the way that they work in memory. But we can pass either of them to this print in array function, and they get implicitly converted to this thing that's a pointer to the data and an integer that tells you the length. And that's very, very convenient, right? Um, so let's, let's run that. I believe I compiled it. Nope. All right, so this is part four. So our function here tells us how many items the array has. Note that it has this dot count, just as if it were a struct that had a count in it, because that's how I wrap the, um, the pointer with the integer. Instead of making them two parameters, they're crammed together into one uh, struct behind the scenes. Um, and then I'm iterating over them and printing out the value of each item. So here we go. And we're doing it once to each array, and the arrays and the contents of the arrays appear identical to this function, even though they're coming from different places. Um, but you never have to explicitly grab a pointer and lose the length information in order to do this, right? So that's pretty cool. Um, now, in the future, this is not implemented yet, but in the future, you'll be able to set the size of your index in these arrays, right? So if you have some dynamic array or even like an unknown length array on a struct somewhere, you might care about the struct packing and how big that thing is. And right now, by default, uh, in a 64-bit architecture, these are all 64-bit integers. And you might get nervous about like, oh my god, I, only, I know there's never less than a th or never more than a thousand things in this array, so why would I put... Um, why would I waste all those bits? Well, eventually you'll be able to say this. It's a float of that's n wide, uh, but the index is only a u16, right? Or it's a dynamic array, but the count and the reserve size are only u32. Um, I started implementing that in the parser, but it's just it's complication that I don't want in the back end yet. Uh, but it'll come soon. Um, maybe maybe later than sooner. It's not that important, honestly. Um, yet. It's important for serious users. Okay, iteration. Let me compile this for part five. So like I said, when I build gameplay code, I'm just iterating over arrays all the damn time. Um, and what, you know, in C and C++, I have macros that help me iterate over arrays. One of the first serious languages I learned in college was Lisp, okay? And the, the Lisp guys uh, and Scheme guys and people like that um, have this philosophy that uh, iterating over arrays of stuff is a very powerful way to program and that transforming one array into another is a very powerful way to program and that's what I learned in college and it's true but it's false, right? It's very true in that you can express uh, a lot of work in a very simple and encapsulated way that's easy to think about. It's false in those languages because the way they do it is so darn memory inefficient and um, icky and the you know, the dynamic typing makes things really confusing and it's really easy to get lost in like what's in the array. I believe in a language, a curly brace language, you can do a much better job than you can in Lisp actually. Um, if you factor in all elements like how hard it is to debug your program. Um, but anyway, inevitably what happens when I'm programming, and this is an example that actually happened in that little Galaga game, Space Invaders game, which is why I put this into the next list of features because I really wanted it. So I had this for, and like I demoed last time, um, I, I had this array of particles, right? It's stored on a particle emitter. There's a bunch of particles, and I want to simulate each particle to make it fly through space. And each particle is, right, I'm visiting every particle, and I'm calling it p, and then I'm calling this function on p. But eventually, I want to say, OK, well, once p has flamed out, I want to destroy p and remove it from that array of particles, right? Um, and the problem is just, if your for loop is too simplistic, as soon as I want to do that, I have to rewrite it into some other loop, right? I have to write it as a for that doesn't iterate over the array anymore, but iterates over the count of the array and then explicitly indexes, right? Or I need to, um, you know, uh, 
make it a while loop. Like this is what I actually ended up doing is I said, okay, I is zero. And then while it's less than the count on the array, uh, visit each particle. Okay. And then simulate that particle. And if it's elapsed is bigger than the lifetime, then call some removal function, uh, but leave I the same because we re replace the current thing with the new guy, right? Otherwise increment I like you normally would want in the while loop. This is a bug prone way to do things. And it's annoying in the very first lecture, one of the things that I said was that small increments in functionality shouldn't result in discontinuities in how you write the program, right? Like just because I want to remove something from this for loop, I shouldn't have to rewrite the whole freaking for loop into something else, right? So one of the things I'm going to talk about now is this remove primitive um, that lets us turn this into this, right? Um, without having to go through all this kind of mess of explicitly talking about the index. So I say for each P in this particles array, simulate it. And then if it's elapsed time is greater than its lifetime, then remove P, right? Um, what is P? Well, P is that iterator, right? And the for loop knows what array p is attached to because it's right there and uh, it's very easy um, it's very simple so you can think of remove as being inherent in this loop like the way that break and continue are right it, it might be weird to see a new one of those if you've never seen it before but this is like break or continue but it's not about flow control it's about data control it's about removing the current element from the array anyway so on to the example here we've got our static and dynamic array again, and we're filling them up. And then I'm going to have this unknown sized array just to show that, you know, you don't just have this when you're passing a parameter, you can assign to it. So, um, you know, now I've got an unknown size array and it's the same as the static array, but it's got the count stored explicitly with it. Um, and then I'm going to for loop over all of these and do this simple printf, right? So for everything in the static array, I'm going to print uh, that item and everything in a dynamic array and everything in the unknown size array. So uh, let's run that. This is a long, longer example in terms of output, but here we go. So there's no surprise. All these arrays are working. They go zero to nine. They all behave the same in terms of iterating. Okay. Now a new thing that I added that didn't exist last time is that, you know, sometimes you want the index into the array as well as the element, right? And you could do that by just always iterating over the index, but that's inconvenient because usually I care about the element, right? So now you can say two things. I can say for value comma index, right, in this array, printf that, right? So now I've got index is which element in the array we are and value is the actual value at that position. Uh, here they're the same because we just made them the same up here, right? Um, that's the point. Those will change in a minute. Um, so that's a nice thing. You can always get at the index. Um, I'll get I'll get more specifically into how remove works in a little bit. Um, okay. Another thing you might want to do is change the array while you're iterating over it, right? By default, if you iterate over an array, um, you're going to visit the elements by value, which means if you try to change one of those elements, it's it's only going to change in the body of your loop, right? Um, but I can use this little uh, pointer sigil here and just say I'm going to visit p by pointer, by pointer, right? Or visit every element of static array by pointer. And now P is a pointer to each element instead of actually being the value of the element, right? So now I can say, it's a little confusing because of all the stars, right? But I'm gonna say the contents of P are gonna be multiplied by the contents of P, right? So I'm squaring ele every element of the array. I'm not printing it here though, but then I'm calling this print in array function, um, which I guess is this, it's this one from the previous example, right? So just to say that we're going to modify the value and it's going to stay modified outside the loop, right? So here's our print int array and all these values are squared, right? Instead of zero to nine, now, uh, you know, 981, 864, etc. So that's great. Um, all right, so let's talk about removal a little more specifically and how that then motivated me to make non-local break and continue which some languages have. I felt like we should have it. Um, I've got another print integers function. I guess I could have called that previous one that I just called, but whatever. We've got another one in here locally. Maybe I just like local functions. Um, it's a little bit different. It, it prints a little bit different strings. Maybe that's why I did it. I just wanted different strings so I could know where I was in the list. Um, 
So this tells us how many values, and it prints them one by one, right? Oh, um, but this time it's, it is written a little bit differently. So note that I'm not specifying my iterators at all, right? So as I mentioned last time, I'm just saying four over the array. So we get this implicit variable it that says, you know, that, that becomes every value in the array, like p was in the earlier example. But now you also get it index if you want it, which is the index of it. Um, I could have called this something like, you know, i or something like that, but that, whoops, that felt wrong. It felt wrong because, you know, i is a variable that you'd use a lot, and it's easy. Having it be too much like it, it means you can typo it. So since you maybe want the index less often, I felt like it was better to have it be a slightly longer name. But as always, these things are changeable. So uh, this is two implicit variable names, uh, and we're using them both. And you can see that that works just great here. Now we've got 14 items instead of 10, because I wanted to be different. Um, OK, so I'm going to iterate over this, and I'm going to do a removal, um, right? So we're starting with, again, 0 map to 0, 1 map to 1, etc. When I hit 6, I'm going to remove that element. So 6 should no longer be in the array. And when I hit 11, I'm going to remove that element. So 11 should no longer be in the array. And then I'm also going to break. So here I say if I hit 12, I should remove the element, but that shouldn't actually happen because we're going to break before that. So 12 should not ever be in our array, right? So now we'll go here, and you'll see uh, that that's true. We go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and once we hit 6, we have 13, actually. Um, the reason we have 13 is because that was pulled off the end of the array, right? This remove, by default, is a non-ordered remove. Um, I toyed around with adding a keyword like remove ordered, that's a much slower operation, and I'm not sure we really want it. Like, I sort of feel like if you want that, maybe you want to call your own function that takes this more seriously. But if there's demand for it, it's not too hard to put an ordered remove in. But um, I find that most of the cases in which I want this, I'm treating my array as a bag of stuff. Like, here's all the uh, items in your inventory, right? And I don't necessarily care what order that those happen in, because the variables that say what inventory slot they are and how much space they take up are probably in a struct somewhere, usually. Um, Anyway, that's a simple case. So that scrambles our array a little bit, but now there's only 12 items because we removed those other two items. Um, so now, um, oh, by the way, I said remove i here. I guess I took out this example, but um, you could say remove j, for example, and remove from an outer loop. I'm going to demo non-local break and continue here. Um, and remove actually works non-locally, just like break and continue. Uh, so let me demo that. So, so down here, as the last thing in this example, you can see this sort of grid of numbers. And, you know, it's counting in i and j. So we've got this loop. Go from j 0 to 9. Each j makes a new line. Um, i goes from 0 to 9. And we're doing these defers so we can just make sure that these little punctuations happen at the right time. Uh, it's just sort of a language debugging exercise. Um, so here's what we're saying. Uh, if i is equal to 8, then don't print this, right? Just continue through i. So as you can see here, we go i, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, where i equals 8, we've got no numbers in between the two dots, right? So that's what that continue does, right? But if i equals 5 and j equals 5, then continue j. Well, what does continue j means? Well, it means continue back at this loop where j is the iterator, right? Not our local loop, but the outside loop. So you can see when we get to i is 5 and j is 5, Suddenly, we don't just break off here, but we break off the whole line and go on to the next line, right? And then here we're saying, well, if, if i is 5 and j is 8, then break out of j, right? So this is just like the C and C++ break, but instead of breaking out of our local loop, we break out of the outer loop, right? So here, there, if we didn't break, there would be a line 9 here, right? But notice there's no line 9. That's because we stopped, right? Um, so that, uh, that's pretty nice. When you use the f a for loop with these iterators like this, uh, especially with explicit names, um, then uh, you have a very nice label to use to refer to that loop. With a while loop, there's no syntax in the language to attach a label to it. Um, we, you know, maybe we'll add that later if we need to, but it would feel a little weird. Maybe while can sort of figure it out. Like if you have a while and then a Boolean comparison, it can sort of decide that the variable in the comparison is the iterator. I don't know. Um, anyway, 
Uh, that, uh, this takes care of almost everything that I ever want to do when looping, and it puts it into a style that's very terse, and that's implemented by the compiler again. So when you step through your program in the debugger, you don't have to do all this maddening, like stepping through iterators and glue functions like you do in C++. The compiler will treat you right, and the debugger will treat you right. Okay, let's talk about enums. I don't feel like I'm going to finish before, well, uh, there's only seven parts, so maybe we'll finish before Handmade Hero. Um, okay, let's go to part six. So I demoed enums last time, but now um, I wanted to add a lot of introspection information to enums because that's one of the things that I tend to really want. Um, this is just a sort of a sneak peek at what's going to happen a lot later in the language because um, really we're going to want this kind of introspection on everything, right? But for now, I said, okay, an enum, when you do an enum like this, that's actually syntactic sugar for a struct that has some elements that tells you things about the enum, right? So here we're going to say this enum hello has some number of members, right? That's count number of members, which is just an item uh, that gets declared in this struct. It'll tell me the lowest value and the highest value, um, you know, it'll, uh, and of course I can use the members. So the members get namespaced on this enum right now. If you want to make them global, you can use using, which I'm not going to demo now. Using will be next time. Um, anyway, so let's just, let's start this. So here we go. Hello has four members. It ranges from 0 to 81, right? So this first member is going to be 0, just like it would in C or C++. But when you get to third, it gets set to this arbitrary value, which, just to show off, I define later, right, which is 80, and then fourth increments that to be 81, right? So we have that um, hello ranges from 0 to 81, and then I'm manually printing the name of every single one down here. So first, second, third, and fourth are 0, 1, 80, and 81. But we also get compile time information about what the names and the values of all the enum identifiers are. They get packed into an array called names and an array called values that are stored on the stru struct created by this enum. That's called type hello, right? So I can iterate over hello's names and print the name of every enum and the value of that, right? So the values is a parallel array. So I'm using this it index, right, to index the values array that's parallel to the it that I'm visiting, right? So I could I could say hello.names it index, right? So let me let me compile that and show you that that does the same thing. Right? So I'm iterating over this list and printing out the names of the enums, right? This isn't hard coded. This one's hard coded. Let me get rid of the hard coded one just so you can know for sure that that's working. Right? So there we go. Um, I don't know that there's much more to say about that, but you, de you know, how many times have you wanted to like print out an enum for debugging or in an error message and you had to like define all these freaking macros that like, whatever, it's terrible. So the compiler just does that for you. Eventually it'll do that for you for everything. Uh, okay. And again, this is, you know, these are starting to look like features like you see in other high level languages, but this doesn't affect the level of control that you have. This is just as low level as C or C++, actually as C really. Um, forget C++, uh, but um, it's giving you this additional information that you should have been given many, many years ago, right? And you probably do, you get at least a lot of this in D, for example. I know D gives you the, the value range. I don't know if it gives you the names. Uh, it probably does. You know, the D people are smart. Um, all right, so there's a couple other members that are type members, right? So enums are strict types. You can't assign an enum to a, the wrong enum and make that mistake. That's a compile time error. Um, so hello.strict is the strict type of this enum. It'll only match to other things in this array, right? So I can say x is hello.first and hello.second, but if I try to say x equals 10, which is a valid u16, right, unsigned 16-bit number, uh, that's actually going to give me a type mismatch right, in line 421, long demo program, line 421, um, right? So I can't do that. Uh, okay, so we fixed our program again. But there's another type called loose, which is, uh, you know, this type, basically. Whatever the values of the enum happen to be representationally on the CPU, 
Uh, so I can set this to 10, or if I want to do weird math on my enums or something, I can cast one of those values to the loose type. And now that's a U16, but I don't have to hard code the fact that it's a U16, right? It can be, this is like saying, whatever that representational type of that enum is, cast this member to it. So you can have very strictly typed enums, you can have loosely typed enums, you win either way, right? So now, you know, I can assign Y to casting this, um, and it is, it's one or whatever that I print here. All right, uh, last part, inlining. Um, uh, okay, C++ mode. So C has this thing that's really bad for people trying to make fast code where inlining is a hint. It's like register in C, like register was a hint that, hey, maybe you should put this parameter or local variable in a register. And that way of handling things, I'll just say, causes a lot of problems, especially people who try to make uh, ambitious video games. But I think for everybody, I think people don't realize it's as much of a problem as it does. So for example, um, Chandler Carruth has this uh, keynote at BoostCon, uh, optimizing the emergent structures of C++ from 2013. You can watch it on YouTube right here. And one of the things he talks about is how hard it is to inline and how hard it is for the compiler to make good inlining decisions. And I'm watching that video and I'm just thinking, yeah, that's really hard, but instead of people putting so much energy into this, I wish that they would put energy into other parts of the language, right? Because the kinds of, when he, when he says emergent structures of C++, he's talking about when you have a lot of glue code and a lot of so-called zero cost abstractions, you get layer upon layer of all this stuff that needs to get inlined in order to be fast, right? In order for the compiler to see everything in one place and optimize it better. Um, now, first of all, I think when you get too much glue code like that, your code is just bad because it's hard to understand code with that many layers of abstraction anyway. You shouldn't be putting that kind of abstraction into your program if you can help it, right? Sometimes, sometimes it's the right thing, but not always, and it should be minimized, right? But secondly, this idea that the compiler is magically going to make the right inline decisions or better inline decisions than I can is not correct, I don't believe, right? At least in many specific cases. There's this uh, idea that has taken root among compiler people, right? And the idea is you shouldn't try to be smarter than the compiler. And I regard that idea as woefully wrong. Uh, just look at the output of a compiler sometime on complicated code and you'll just see how not smart that compiler is, right? It misses all kinds of things that it should be able to optimize, right? Um, Chandler's talk uh, specifically about inlining, though, should be convincing enough um, for this specific case that I'm going to talk about. But anyway, uh, this idea you can't or you shouldn't be try to be smarter than the compiler or don't think you're smarter than the compiler, uh, you know, comes from this philosophy that I'm writing a program. I have no idea on what CPU or operating system this program is going to run. So how can I intelligently say register or inline or anything like that? The compiler is going to know a lot more about the target platform than I do. Uh, and so it's going to make those decisions. And that's fine if you honestly don't know anything about your target platform. But actually, in my industry and in many industries, we actually do, right? And we're not just like throwing some code against the wall and hoping it's fast. We're compiling our program. We're looking at the resulting assembly language. We're saying, yes, that's fast or no, that's not fast, or this, you know, we're profiling it. We're saying this has too many instructions. Look, I can see right here, why, why are these instructions in there? And, and we're doing our best to fix it, right? So the compiler is a better tool if it helps us fix these problems. And so the way that you specify inlining here is for serious programmers, right? Um, again, this is a language for good programmers and to help them do what they want to do, not to prevent bad programmers from shooting themselves in the foot. So if you say inline on a function declaration, for example, similarly to the way you would in C or C++, that means that function will always be inlined unless that inlining is impossible. How could it be impossible? Well, uh, it's a recursive function, right? <laughs> it's trying to inline itself. Compiler's got to stop eventually, right? Um, but in all normal cases, when you say that something should be inlined, uh, it will be. So here I'm defining some local functions. The first is just plain old regular function. 
the compiler could decide to inline this or not, depending on uh, what it feels is right for the situation. Uh, for test local b here, I have said this is inline. The compiler will always inline this every single time, again, unless it's impossible. Um, I am guaranteed that, right? That's part of the, f the programming language's definition. And that means you have to specify what impossible means, but you know, that's, we'll deal with that later. Um, part C, uh, I'm saying don't inline this ever, right? No inline is sort of the opposite of inline. Do not ever inline this. You might use that more rarely, but for example, you, want, you might want to make sure that a function exists in the executable so you can hook it, right? Or something like that, right? When you're, when you're messing around at a low level, there's sometimes reasons why you want things to stay there, right? Or uh, you might decide, well, it's not profitable to inline this, and I don't even want the compiler thinking about it. Uh, so let me just turn that off, right? So you can say inline, you can say no inline, right? And so let me uh, compile and run this demo. Whoops, I didn't. Oh, right, this is a different program. I broke it off because it's, it's big. All right, so here I've printed out some, these aren't real warnings. These are just me demonstrating that the compiler is knowing uh, when things are inlined or not inlined, right? So, um, you know, we have a yes inline, a no inline, blah, 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 right? So here, uh, line, uh, line 26 should be, I don't know, line 27 should be a yes inline, and line 28 should be a no inline. And we see that, yeah, 27 is yes inline and 28 is no inline. Okay, now regardless of what these specifiers say, you can choose at the calling site to override them, right? So I can say, even though test local C is defined as no inline, in this case, I'm calling it, I wanna call it inline. This means, again, always inline. The compiler is not following a recommendation, it's following a, a command, right? So these will always be inlined. These will never be inlined, even though this one is declared inline, right? So what this really means is, unless I say otherwise, inline. Uh, OK. Um, and then I have a little directive down here, but we'll, we'll see what that is in a second. Um, so here I've got, so, so that's, that's sort of the first two ways, right? There's actually three ways to determine whether something's inlined or not. Right? The first one is in the function definition. The second one is at the calling site. And the third one is by directive elsewhere in the program. Why would you want to do that? Well, for example, maybe you're targeting a few specific platforms and you want to change who gets inlined or not based on which platform it is. Right? Well, one easy way to do that uh, is to include a platform specific file full of directives, right? So here we've got test D, E, F, and G, and none of them have inline specifiers on the function, but here we've got a, a directive for E and a directive for F, and then way down here, as though it were in a different file, it could be in a different file, but I just tucked it down here, an inline for G, and so those will all, that's as if you had written this in the function header, but you don't have to mess around with like weird if defs or whatever inside the function, right? Um, you can include them on a per platform basis in like a performance template or whatever you want to think about it as that goes alongside your code. But again, as before, I can override these by saying, oh, always inline, I don't care what the directive says, and always don't inline. Um, and so if anyone wants to freeze frame and check all these, I'm pretty sure that <laughs> they will all be in accordance, right? Like line 74 to 6 is no inline, which is what we have here. Now, the one uh, thing to say about this is we don't have a real back end yet. So this doesn't make it all the way to the back end because you can't tell C this. There's no way to say this in C. Um, once we have LLVM or some other real back end, then this will go all the way to machine code. Right now, this is just built all the way from the front to the middle of the compiler. Uh, but that's it. Um, that is all I have in terms of uh, feature rundown for this time. Uh, for next time, I think I want to do more introspection and maybe the object model because I think, you know, like every once in a while people say, well, why don't you use D or why don't you use Nimrod or something like that? And um, the more I work on this language, the more I find ideas that are going to go further and further from uh, what those languages do. And I, 
I hope that's starting to become apparent already, and um, I think it'll become ever more apparent by next time or the time after that. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to take a short voice saving break, and I'll be back in a few minutes to take questions. Handmade Hero started three minutes ago, so you can also go see that. Uh, sorry if I raced through this a little bit quick. I was trying to fit it all into an hour. So we'll have a couple minute break, and I will be right back.